Thanks. And then we're going to jump straight to our panel. I'm really excited to have uh, Tanya Rolf and Danny Houston here um, giving us their time to share their experiences. So welcome, uh, Tanya and Danny. So Jobs for Women. Um, we are a jobs board and a podcast with a difference. I'm not going to read everything out on the slide. Um, essentially, what makes us different is that we are um, we're really investing in our talent pool of untapped uh, women who are ambitious, want to make a change, want to become leaders and want to make a difference. Um, so we are the UK's DEI solution to recruiting women here in the UK. Um, we work with equitable companies who are really who are really committed to making work work for women, nurturing them, supporting them. Um, so we work with companies that really prioritise their DE&I efforts. Um, we're really excited about our wellbeing and careers platform. It's a membership platform that launches this summer. It's going to be free for age 16 to 19 year olds. So we're doing huge outreach for colleges for young women to inspire them in the early stage of their career. So we're really excited about that. And this webinar is one of many that we run alongside our surveys and that's to really spark conversation about gender equality share stories gather data and just make work like i said work for women in a nice place to be so that we can retain women in the workforce and um see them become leaders and we're releasing the uh, info from our international women's day survey next wednesday so we're really excited about that so why women in finance um i'm not again i'm not going to read out all the data from the slides because we're here to chat to the panel but just to to give a brief overview women hold 24 percent of senior leadership positions and if you look back at the figures it is slow progress so although we're getting there it's 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 happening ever so slowly so the more we do things like this the more we speak to experts the more we have the conversation and the more work we do with early careers um the more we can start to make some serious change so the financial times reported that just 16 percent of board positions in the top 50 investment banks are held by women and we know that black asian and minority ethnic women face significant barriers accessing and progressing into senior roles <clears throat> and there's a comparison here against white women with 6.7 percent of black and minority ethnic women holding senior management positions <clears throat> excuse me compared to 10.3 percent of white women and more likely to face discrimination and bias in the workplace so i've said <clears throat> excuse me we're slowly making progress um, a new financial think tank found that 78 percent of firms signed up to the voluntary women in finance charter and are meeting or on track to meet their targets but like i said just five percent upon last year there's a lot going on at the moment in terms of retention of women across all industries. The Fawcett Society reported 25% of women are more likely to leave. They cited menopause, but we know that there's loads of other issues. And in our Women in Engineering webinar, that came up as a huge, a huge point that there's a lot of very talented, very experienced senior women that are leaving the profession. <clears throat> so more needs to be done to find out why and how we can retain them. Um, and I've talked about early careers. Um, women make up 51% of applicants in finance under, relate, under uh, graduate courses, but finance specific finance related subjects such as economics and accounting, they make up slightly less. So we're really passionate about reaching early careers. Um, you know, when I think back to when I was deciding which degree to do, if I'd have been armed with information and empowered um, by senior women or had a mentor, then I know that my career perhaps would have gone on a different trajectory. Um, yeah, and we're going to talk a lot about investment. Um, I know Tanya is our go to for that. Um, so women are underrepresented in certain areas such as finance and investment management, making up 36% of students. So that is a whistle stop tour of, of finance. I'm excited to introduce our panel. We've got Tanya Rolf, co-founder of Sophia and Harriet, and Danny Houston, head of financial analysis at AJ Bell. So I'll start just by introing uh, Tanya. Tan Tanya and I met years and years ago, and uh, the universe has realigned us um, in our mission for gender equality. Tanya is the co-founder of Sophia, which is a financial education platform for, for financial services companies and corporates who want to offer financial education to their female customers and employees. 
After years of working in corporate law firms and seeing huge gender issues, Tanya decided it was time for a change and to put that fire in her belly to work and address gender equality. Tanya moved from London to Singapore and started the first all-female angel investment group to invest in women-led startups. And Tanya's experienced gender biases amongst institutional investors, and she had an, a eureka moment, which we talked about when we recorded the podcast, when she realised that women were the answer to the gender bias she saw within entrepreneurship. And female founders received less than 3% of all venture capital funding, which I hope we can talk about as well. So Sophia was born with a mission to educate and empower women to mobilize the almost $93 trillion in wealth held by women. And Sophia teaches women how to gain control of their personal finances and address the gender wealth gap and investing gap. And Tanya is also co-founder of Harriet, busy woman. Harriet supports female founders as they fundraise for external capital and Tanya works with founders to help them secure the right funding for their businesses and partners with strategic venture capital funds with a focus on bridging the gender gap, an essential yet challenging metric for VCs. Wow, lots to talk about Tanya. Welcome to Thank our you. discussion today. And then last but no means least, Danny Houston. Welcome, Danny. So happy to have you here. Hello. Head of Financial Anal Analysis at AJ Bell, one of the UK's leading um, investment pl platforms. So Danny joined the company in 2021 and works across television, radio and online platforms as a commentator and writer delivering insight and analysis across the UK and global business and financial sectors and Danny brings experience and insight from a 19 years working at the BBC presenting and reporting on business news across a variety of programs how exciting can't wait to hear more about that Danny so you've worked at um, BBC Look North and latterly Radio 5 Live's flagship business program Wake Up Money and you're passionate about making financial reporting understandable and relevant to all audiences and you bring a high level of financial and economic expertise. Danny was instrumental in setting up AJ Bell's Money Matters campaign, which is aimed at helping women become becoming more confident with their finances and narrow the 1.65 trillion gender investment gap. Wow. I mean, b b between you, uh, we, we've just got this, haven't we? What, what a, a wealth of expertise. <laughs> so we're just going to dive straight in um, to the questions. I'll start with you, Tanya. Can you just... Tell us a little bit about, obviously, I mean, we don't have, we don't have all day. I know you've done, you, your career is expansive. Can you just give us a little intro into your career and how you've come to form your two companies? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon from Singapore. Um, so I, I think, as you mentioned, worked in law firms for a lot of, a lot of years and realised huge gender bias within law firms and I think that's probably quite typical um, of a lot of corporate um, particularly finance and and big uh, big corporate like where I was in a big international firm and um, moved to Singapore for various other reasons and and it was here that I decided okay I've had enough of the um, of the law firm world but what can I do I had two small babies a newborn and a toddler and so I, I went out and started to angel invest so just which is essentially just using a bit of my own money five thousand ten thousand dollars at a time finding great entrepreneurs to invest into and then I said oh I'm really enjoying this this is fantastic like being a bit more commercial when you're in a law firm you know, it, it's it's really quite um, rigid and you you become a bit of a one-trick pony as, as I think a lot of people do in a corporate environment so now I'm on like the business side and more entrepreneurial side and it took me about five minutes to realize there were literally no women to invest into and I was scratching my head thinking where are all these women um surely Asia's just not full of men I mean this is ridiculous and then I did some research obviously and discovered that female entrepreneurs receive such little funding so this was when I first moved to Singapore so it's about six years ago and then I realized that um, well, the, one of the big reasons to why female entrepreneurs are not getting any funding is because there are no women 
investors. Mm -hmm. um, and when then when I you know went off on my next research project to understand why women are not investing, and I needed to speak to about five girlfriends at the time, um, local to me in Singapore, all expats, so all high earners, professional or well educated, and realised they haven't got a clue what they're doing with their money, so they just sit on it, and or the husband does something with it. So I said, okay, I'm making this connection. So I launched this investment platform, which was just women investing into female entrepreneurs, morphed that into a venture capital fund and then went out to find my investors and again came across lack of women and so I said oh hold on hold on a second this doesn't make any sense I don't want my impact on the world to just be that I lost my soul which was being destroyed fundraising trying to fundraise as a female found as a female fund manager which is very difficult in the first place, uh, especially in Asia as a non-Asian female. Um, and then furthermore, to invest that money into female entrepreneurs, it kind of just blew everybody's mind here. You know, I was probably like eight years ahead of my time. Um, so I stopped that and said, actually, the answer is in women. It lies within women. And you alluded to this, Zoe. If we have more females engaged with their money and empowered and educated from a really early age. Number one, gender equity, gender equality is possible because money is power essentially, whether we like it or not, it is. And, and number two, we support female entrepreneurs who are building businesses nine times out of 10 for us women, because no one else is gonna do it. So we've got to mobilize this money we've got in the bank, which is $93 trillion, which is no small amount of money to you know build businesses to support us in pregnancy menopause fertility issues you know menstruation all of these things massively overlooked for women and we have to do something about that as women collectively wow. pause. <laughs> i love that that's like the perfect soundbite isn't it i love that and we talked about that on the podcast didn't we how women startups or women entrepreneurs are creating businesses for women which i find fascinating and for all the reasons that you you talked about wow um and danny so you've had um, a very very busy very ex you've got so much experience in in finance and then obviously all of the broadcasting which is exciting which came first did you start with finance were you always going to do a finance um qualification uh, no absolutely not would you believe that i started my broadcast career in entertainment journalism so going around talking to pop stars film stars you know on the circuit where you get to ask inane questions about the latest movie which was brilliant and i absolutely loved it um but when i started to get more involved in serious journalism in inverted commas i hasten to add um it, it was at a time when um around the financial crash um and we were talking a lot about people's finances and the difficulties that they were facing and a role was created at the time which was uh, as a, a business journalist and i thought well that that sounds really exciting that that works for me i've been doing a lot of politics up to that point and just felt that the solutions could be found within business and entrepreneurship and it was at that point that i quickly discovered exactly what what tanya was talking about there there was this gender bias so as a woman talking about business, I would go into a factory or a boardroom uh, with a camera crew who happened to be male. And the CEO often would direct the answers to the questions to the male cameraman. And it, it was just something that I think everybody that I worked with kind of accepted, but thought, well, this is crazy. And then when I got the opportunity to move on to Five Live and it was purely focused on finance and business that the role that I was doing, I used to get so many messages from women saying it's really great to hear a woman talking about this because it makes me realize that this is actually for me as well. This is important for me. And the way that you're talking about it in really simple terms, using language that that doesn't have that male bias, because so much language within the financial sector has that sort of male tilt to it. You know, I'm thinking about the likes of seeking alpha and bull runs and, and that kind of thing. And 
I, it was lovely just to get those messages. On the other hand, you would get some messages from men saying, why is a woman talking about business? You've got a squeaky voice, get off. Um, but from there, uh, I had been struggling a bit um, with work-life balance, particularly going through the menopause. And it's something that so many people talk about. And it was one of the reasons that I made the switch from television to, to radio, because it meant that I could have my notes in front of me because my brain was a bit scrambled, a bit like when I had my kids and I was suffering from baby brain. And the opportunity came up then to move into um, finance, to work with AJ Bell, to do what I had been doing but to focus much more on the gender investment gap. And I, when I joined the company, the first thing that we did was to set up this Money Matters campaign, which is squarely aimed at women. Men are more than welcome to come and listen and to, to take uh, information from the podcasts and the articles that we do. They are for everybody. But we try and focus on issues that women want to talk about and there is a difference and i i don't think that sometimes we get a bit of pushback often from men saying why are you sort of doing this just for women why are you singling out women but there is a difference and i think that it's really important that women's investment journeys get given the same amount of focus as, as men's investment journeys just exactly as tanya was saying yeah, that's really interesting. Um, and this keeps coming up a lot as we're, the more work we're doing and as we're speaking to companies, often there is a question of, well, what about the men? But I think that women have sort of been left behind for so long that now we need to actually really focus um, and give them the same opportunity. That's interesting that you switched um, career. And I, I picked up on when you talked about the, uh, the question's been directed to the male cameraman. This is coming up in our survey, our International Women's Day survey. The anecdotes are, are sort of not too shocking because I kind of expected them, but you know, in terms of authority questioned, assumed to be the junior when the male, you know, in a boardroom full of men. So that's really interesting um, that you say that. Um, and then thinking about your careers, you're both very experienced. What would you say, um, a sort of the barriers that you faced along the way. I know we've just talked about, um, you know, like things like having questions directed to the male in the room. Are there any barriers that you can sort of talk about? Um, Tanya, can you think about anything that you faced in finance specifically? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, I could talk about this until midday. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was a fund manager and I think, I forget what the stat is, but you know, there's, I think it might be around 12% or something like that of fund managers in the world are women. Um, but probably, you know, 90% of investors investing into your fund are men. So trying to convince them. Yeah, I mean, I've had some hilarious, I mean, they weren't hilarious, but I can look back now um, and, and laugh at them, but they're not funny because this is what women are actually, the reality of what we're facing. But I remember pitching um, my fund um, and the irony of running a fund for women entrepreneurs to help women overcome the challenges they face with fundraising is that as a fund manager, I was facing exactly those same challenges that I'm trying to help women overcome, trying to raise capital too. And that was never lost on me. Um, you know, I remember pitching to someone and he said, um, you know, oh, why don't you come to my house on Friday night at 9 p.m. and pitch there? I live in this mansion on this road, um, which was wholly inappropriate, of course. Um, but that, and I remember also pitching to another chap and being told, um, oh, well, that's all great and everything, but let me tell you about my um, startup idea, which is all about bras. And I just got the impression that he just wanted to talk about bras um, and like, you know, behave like a, a prepubescent child um, and I just thought oh my goodness what am I doing um, the problem I think that as a fund manager but also across the board in finance um, not that I've had any other roles I mean I'm a, I do financial education now but I'm not within a large corporate but the problem I see is that 
it's not it's not appealing as a as a career option it's a bit like when I was in law firms there's very few role models role modeling how it can look in a positive way yes you might have 10 percent of the partnership as female but are they females that you aspire to be um, do they inspire you um, and the answer often is no because often they've sacrificed so much of so many other things in their life that you just look at them and say well that's exactly what I don't want to be like so we don't have enough role models obviously it's it's severely male dominated so it doesn't appeal um and one of the important things I think that we talked about Zoe on the podcast is and it's it's, it's very difficult to a lot of parents a lot of teachers are much more inclined um i forget what the data is but it's much more inclined to talk to boys about careers in finance about entrepreneurship running a business than they are to girls so very early on in our lives we're kind of shying away from this because it's not necessarily something that is put on the table as an option and and that just and then often you know i think girls shy away from maths for example um, you know, girls don't often, you know, excel in maths. And uh, even though academically, I think still we surpass boys in almost all subjects. We, we're academic and we're going to university at higher rates. So it's not an education thing. It's more around when I speak to um, women, uh, young girls, is that they're not interested in playing in that arena. They want to make a difference. And finance doesn't necessarily inspire them because they're looking at it and just seeing all these guys I wonder what the solution is then you know when you you've just raised some really interesting points and is it because of their the the way you know the the gender bias their preconceived ideas about finance is it because I mean it probably all of the above um white middle class men um no role models I don't know what uh, Danny have you got any thoughts on that I had never considered a career in finance. Um, I, it was just not something which I thought was available to me. Uh, as Tanya said, that, that there were no role models for me to aspire to, whereas, you know, there were plenty of, of female role models within journalism and there were plenty of women who helped me in my career as I built my career. I, I fell into finance quite by chance. And I've joined a financial institution quite late on in my career. So I'm not having to deal with a lot of the issues that, that younger women have to face. I have had an incredibly warm reception. I am treated with respect. People listen when I walk into a room and I, I feel incredibly valued and that I bring something really important to the party. But at the same time, I have two teenage girls my eldest about to take her GCSEs. She really struggles with maths. So they've both been having maths tuition for, well, since COVID. And I, I don't think that helped at all because they didn't get maths lessons during COVID. It was all online, you know, which is fine. But I also think that the maths that is taught in schools is the wrong maths. They should be being taught about personal finance. They should be being taught about how maths impacts their lives going forwards about buying a house about interest rates compound interest pensions the kind of math that you can get hold of and understand why it's important to you and I think that would make a big difference in the way that women interact and, and perceive of maths and I think that the kind of maths that is actually taught you know at, at GCSE level shouldn't be taught until you get to A level you know, if if you can understand and you enjoy it, brilliant, do it at A-level. That's the point where, you know, otherwise you lose people. I've managed to persuade my daughter now when she goes on to do her A-levels that she's going to take an enrichment class in maths just because she's okay at it. She's really good at physics and it just will help. So I think that the education system needs to change. And I also think that Having more women like yourself, like Tanya, hopefully like me in positions where we're visible, we're talking about finance, we're telling girls 
and boys that finance is an option as a career. So take a look because it's it's not just for a middle aged white man in a suit. It is for everybody. And that will make our financial institutions better. And it will be sort of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy almost. Yeah, fantastic points there, Danny. I mean, early careers, again, it's it's almost like reprogramming um, and accessibility that, you know, you can, you can do. And I love what you said about um, it's the type of maths, because I can relate to that. I, w- I enjoyed maths, but once it hit a certain level, you know, that I couldn't apply because I'm very sort of vocational and I like to sort of apply and get, get going. I'm a bit of a doer. So as soon as it went over my head in terms of, well, how is this going to work? I, I, exactly what you said, it, it, it was lost on me. And I, since I've started Jobs for Women, I have thought, I, you know, I wonder if my career would have gone a different way if things would have been different. So I feel like we need to use our power and our voice t- to make this change. So we've talked about early careers. Um, I mentioned in the start about Black, Asian and, eth- and minority ethnic um, women that have an even smaller percentage of seeing role models and i think it was 6.7 percent in in leadership um and we've so we've talked um and what was interesting is i spoke to a college in london yesterday um that we're going to start working with to offer our careers platform and the principal was so engaged because she talked about her um, black asian and minority ethnic girls that she said don't necessarily have a support system at home or parents haven't done the ed- higher education. Um, so she was really, really interested in having this sort of platform and access to people like you two amazing women, you know, to, to put, possibly have like mentorships. So she said it's kind of like bridging that gap. So for those um, young women in that institution, they're perhaps definitely not thinking about finance. So it's kind of like, how can we make it more accessible and have more conversations like this? So thank you for that really good point, Stanley. So when we're thinking about, so we've talked about early careers, what about middle career when women um, are potentially already in a role, they can't see any role models for leadership, they're potentially or quite probably being paid less than men. What's what do we want to say and what do what barriers can we break down for sort of mid-level uh, women sort of halfway through their career? Tanya, any ideas on that? Um, yeah, is, do you mind if I just make a point on something Danny yes, said about... Absolutely. Just because, sorry, just because I don't, want, I don't want to miss this point. So there's a difference between maths and life skills. And I think what we're talking about when it comes to managing your money, understanding like understanding how to manage debt and all of these things are life skills and I think that you're I I would agree wholeheartedly about trimming down maths um, because when was the last time you used your algebra or any of those complex I mean never since I walked out of the mathematics (laughs) exam never um so but the challenge we've got just to put it into context is is that schools are not um schools are not uh assessed on the life readiness of their students they are assessed on the academic achievements in their GCSEs and A levels or equivalents around the world and and until that changes and we actually say well actually how life ready are your students students um that's not we're not going to see that in within the curriculum because teachers are already overworked and overrun and they're trying to fit everything in so that we cannot put this burden upon teachers it's not their you know challenge to the, to take on it is the way that schools are assessed and uh that i don't think is is going to change or it's not an easy thing to change which is why it is so important for parents to educate their children on how to manage money. And you can do that, especially our girls, especially our girls, because they're the ones that are shying away very quickly and understanding there's a difference between, I don't enjoy maths in the classroom, but I can understand how I can save for something, I can pay for something, I can budget, I could even invest my money, I could run a lemonade stand and make some money. That's very different. And that I think is falls to us as parents. So I'd love to see more parents taking that role on and that responsibility on for our girls. Sorry, now I'll go back to your question. No, no, can I can I just can I just ask uh, one more thing on that? Why is it you think that um women uh, sorry young girls are are not being talked about finance as much you know like we talked about that 
will maybe focus on the boys is that like just from the past is it because you know years and years ago it was the man's job is it just has it carried on why why is it that we're talking to girls less about money well I, yeah that's a really good question i think it's multifaceted i think uh, in short i think it's that we still treat girls very differently than we do boys we still think that they're very delicate little flowers you know like we've got to look after them wrap them in cotton wool make sure everything's fixed for them and boys they're just a bit more rough and tough so we kind of um are more engaged in that conversation we're still wedded to these traditional roles and we and we often haven't caught up for a lot of families little children are looking up at parents dad going out to work making the money mummy staying home so in some instances the role models they've got within the family show that you know i don't necessarily need to worry about this because i'm a girl and um, there's that there's um often in marriages whether consciously or unconsciously, couples divide responsibilities for, to manage the home. And more often than not, the role of investing the money to growing our wealth falls to the man. Um, and again, the woman often says, oh, well, that's your responsibility. I'm taking care of something else and shies away from even knowing what's going on, where the money's gone, you know, and, until a terrible thing happens. And then they have the force to find out what's what's happening retrospectively. So I think there's a lot of like still those traditional role models are impacting. Then as as people have done on this call is like said, OK, this is math. And girls are traditionally going, I don't like math, so I'm probably not good at managing money. Whereas they're very different, understanding financial concepts and 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 just kind of day to day living with managing your money. Can I afford this lunch? How do I save for those Manolo Blahniks? You know, or whatever it is you want is like very different to maths because we've got calculators, we've got Google Sheets and Excel. We don't need to be good at maths to understand concepts of finance. So I think we're adding those two together actually blurs things and makes things a little muddier for, for girls. And I think that financial education, to your point, Zoe, financial education is lacking for everyone. So in an ideal world, kids would go to school, teachers would teach them the concepts, it would be in the curriculum every week. They would be learning something about managing money, growing their money, and then they would come home and the parents would, would bed those that knowledge down through habits, through an allowance every week. And these are the things you get children from around the age of four, familiar and comfortable and safe with money. By the time they're 16, by the time they're 18, by the time they've got their first job at 21, they'll talk about money with anyone. They're open, they're free, they're talking with their friends, they're at lunch with their girlfriends, talking about their investments or how what they're saving for. That's where we need to get to. Normalize the conversation with kids super young, especially the girls. That's it's interesting. Total sense. What... Total sense. Sorry, go ahead, Danny. No, I was just, it's interesting what you said there about talking about those life money issues, because a lot of women that we've spoken to as part of Money Matters don't feel comfortable doing that. They yeah. don't feel yeah. that they understand enough to have those conversations with their kids. And yeah. li life is busy as well. So if they just pay for the stuff that their kids need, they think that that is enough. And they don't realize that actually it's far more beneficial for their kids to give them a couple of quid every week and make them save up and have them see that money grow and maybe talk yeah. about when they're going to spend it, what they want to spend it on, how they're going to save it. Is it going to be in a jar? Is it going to be in a bank account? Those are the things that I think make a big difference. But for a lot of women, particularly women going out to work, they maybe don't have the time to be able to stop and think about yeah. that. And they don't realize the importance of doing that. But women don't have to be the ones to take that on in uh, to teach the children, right? That can be, a, you know, that's a parenting thing. That can be the father or the mother. That should not fall to the, the mother necessarily. But you're absolutely right, Danny. Women are busy, 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 right? We've got everything. We're doing everything, 100%. And, and, and that's often why we shy away from finance and understanding it because women love to know everything about everything before they take some action. We're perfectionists. We want to like research like and and that actually makes us great investors because we make really sound, solid investment choices. But 
it's kind of bordering on procrastination and also it also doesn't give let us take enough action because we're too busy researching but because we're so busy it takes us so long to do that research or we never quite get to the end so we're never confident enough to take that action so it's this vicious cycle so you really need to have my advice is always get a money date money date with your husband money date with your girlfriend learn like you've got to consciously make a decision because you're right we I, I launched a course last year to teach children to teach parents how to interact with their children about money and what I realized is as I was teaching I'm teaching the parent first so I'm teaching the parent before they can go on and teach the child and and I I realized that in my curriculum that's exactly what I'm doing and there's no shame in that because did you receive any financial education at school or from your parents not many of us did so there's no shame in that but we should we can all still start and it's so important as well because you know so, and we can get into this from you know, women at work situation and point of view, you know, knowing what you're worth, salary, asking for the salary that you deserve, salary negotiation, it, it, it feeds into so many things, doesn't it? So just coming back to mid careers, what, what I'm keen to sort of um, talk about is that if a woman um, is already in finance and they're sort of sitting midway through the career, and they're looking up and there's no female role models, I want to know how companies can create pathways to show these incredible women that they can be leaders how is it about making the culture more inclusive is it about having more role models what do you think companies need to be doing to help women sort of midway through the career i'll open it to danny or tanya Go, danny. Oh, I, I think definitely um it's really important to start from the top down and the bottom up. You can't just say, right, I'm going to put, I'm going to bring in a woman to be on the board and that's it, I'm done. Mm -hmm. uh, because I've created a role model, someone for you to look up to, to say that, yes, we are going to promote women. You actually then have to go down to the bottom and help the women at the bottom get to the top. Because otherwise what you've got is a woman at the top and a load of women at the bottom or in the middle of yeah. their careers, but no pathway to take them from that level up to the top level. And I think that happens quite a lot. It's seen as a box ticking exercise. Whereas what happens is if you bring someone in at the top, they need to then have conversations and create pathways and structures so that there is a link up between those two. So that that then becomes... Uh, you know, the, the women at the bottom are then going to be the next women at the top rather than just the, the sort of ceiling still being there and you see what's above you, but it's just one bright shining light and no way to get to it. Uh, and I think that confidence is a big thing. And I think just having somebody in that position is great. But if you're then having that, oh, well, I'm never going to be able to get there. How on earth am I going to be able to get there? What have you done? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I, I would echo that. Um, the only add-on that I would make to that is that you know, one woman is not enough at the top. You know, let's say you've got a, a, a senior suite of 20 men, bringing one woman on uh, is just not enough because what happens is that woman has to fit in with her environment. So often you find that there's a, an element of that woman actually just becomes, uh, you know, just like everyone else in the team because putting your head above the parapet as the sole woman um, does not, you know, is not going to bode well for your career, but also it, it's not... Um, it's not enough to make uh, a difference, of, you know, um, because, and it also puts that woman in a very difficult position because often you're expecting that one woman to be, you know, a contrarian um, amongst, her, amongst her peers. Um, I, I've never had a problem with being a contrarian, but it is quite lonely. Um, <laughs> so um, I think you need, you know, 30% is generally what the finance world targets, right? And I think there's a 30% club and that's a kind of, you know, and I think, so I think that's really important is you need, you need strength in numbers at the top. Yeah, yeah our founder and um, the, the woman that we work with for our Money Matters um, project is Baroness Helena Morrissey, who was a founder of the 20% Club. And yeah. she's been brilliant because she was brought in sort of as, as a shining light alongside another couple of women so that she wasn't a contrarian. She was brought in as a, a chair for, for AJ Bell. But 
she helped empower everybody else along the way. She spends a lot of time in the offices, talking to women, listening to their concerns, and then going and working with HR and trying to sort of put a plan in place. And I think that's really important. And I think if you can surround yourself with a group of women who provide you with help, bolster your confidence, um, you know, that can make a huge difference. I'd never asked for a pay rise or a different pay offer than the one that I've just got. And that was purely because when I moved jobs, I had a conversation with another woman and she said, you are worth this. And like a lot of women do, you sort of go, I'm not worth that. No, you are worth this. Look at the market, look at where your job is sitting. And then that is where you should be aiming at. Don't take less. And I think as a woman, until you've done it that first time, it's it's quite a heart in the mouth moment when you first do it. And then once you've done it, you're like, oh, that was easy. <laughs> but I don't think we hear that enough. We don't share that enough with women. You can ask for what you think you're worth. You might get knocked back, but they might come in halfway and meet you in the middle. Yeah. But again, make that the norm from, you know, kids being four or five years old and um, make that the norm, like that girls are free to ask for what they want. They might not always get it. You can explain to them why they don't get it, especially if it's like the fifth ice cream of the day. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think not pushing, not suggesting that they can't ask for things, I think is um, is really important. Yeah, it's like fi- back to finding, um, allowing them to find their voice and use it. Because yeah. I, I can relate, Danny, when you just talked about that. Like, I remember moving from a job in London and wanting more money, move from a corporate. And, you know, during the interview, they just offered me the same. And I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> knowing my inner being was saying, no, Zoe, ask for more. And I just didn't. And now, oh, if I had my time to come again, I would be asking for more, you know? So yeah, yeah I love that. It, it comes full circle, doesn't it? It's like empowering girls from a young age to use their voice. Um, I know we've got to wrap up soon. I just wanted to finish on, um, why women make great leaders? I know the data is telling us that it makes companies more profitable, but why should companies, financial companies, be really focusing on this and focusing on increasing women in leadership figures? I'll open it up to either of you. I think it's diversity that makes great leadership. Mm-hmm. It's not just about men, women, black, white, ethnic minorities. Um, you know, doesn't matter way you sit in terms of your sexual preferences it's about diversity because society is diverse and if you are operating in a world where your customers are from diverse backgrounds how are you going to know what your customers want if you're only coming at it from one tiny little perspective you're not you're not going to give your customers what they really want and then your customers are going to go and look elsewhere so i think it's not just about women although clearly we're discussing women here and they're an integral part of that but it's about diversity and the more diverse voices you have feeding into your decision making the better your decision making is going to be yeah great response tanya anything to add on that uh, well, uh, Danny's hit the nail on the head. Diver- di- diversity of thought, I think, is, it, is has been proven to be, you know, the most um, beneficial for business. Essentially, when we're talking about businesses, uh, the bottom line is they want to make a good bottom line, right? So, and 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 that's it. Um, and everything else is kind of nice to have, right? Like it's, um, but it's if you're looking at their number one driver, which is their bottom line, diversity. Um, and in all its forms, not just gender, leads to a better bottom line. So I almost feel like I don't need to say anything else. Yeah. You know, yes, yeah. it's the right thing to do. We should have representation. Yet, you know, you employ a woman, 
there's data around what that woman does with the money versus what a man does with the money and that it's much better for our society much better for our environment like women are twice as likely to invest into esg which is better for our people better for our planet i could talk you know for the next week about this but at the end of the day we're talking about businesses and they have a bottom line and a diverse team leads to a diverse leadership team leads to a better bottom line so the end Wow, brilliant soundbite to uh, to end on. Thank you, Tanya and Danny, for joining um, for joining us today. I feel like we've really covered some really important ground, and I think I at Jobs for Women can use a lot of what we talked about. You know, like when we're thinking about younger women, and it's this cycle, and um, yeah, it's really exciting, exciting times ahead. We just need to have more of these conversations. I'm very grateful that you've both given up your time this morning um, to be part of this very important chat. Apologies for the technical issues. Today was not my day, but we'll just let that go. So have a wonderful rest of the day and I will speak to you both soon. Thank you everyone for joining us today. Take care. Thank you.